Hello, everyone. This is Jim Hughes with AFIO Now. We are a program of recorded presentations by senior members of the U.S. intelligence community who have great stories to tell. Today, we have um, a very, very interesting presentation. Our guest is a retired Colonel Mark Mitchell. He has a bachelor's degree from Marquette University, a master's degree from the Naval Postgraduate School. He served as a national security fellow at the Kennedy School. He um, uh, commanded Fifth Special Forces in Iraq in 2010, 2011, served as the Assistant uh, Secretary of Defense for Special Operations and Low Intensity Conflict, SOLIC. And during the Obama administration, he was the Director of Counterterrorism. Uh, but most relevant for today's presentation, uh, he was awarded the Distinguished Service Cross for his efforts during the Battle of Tal e Jangi in northern Afghanistan in November and December of 2001. Mark, welcome to AFIO Now. Thank you, Jim. It's a real honor to join you today. So I guess I'll, I'll start off, um, first of all, by uh, expressing my appreciation for all of those who've served in the uh, intelligence community um, and, and their support to our work in the Department of Defense. Uh, so as Jim mentioned, I uh, start talk today a little bit about my experience uh, in Afghanistan um, right after 9-11 uh, and uh, going in and linking up with uh, Team Alpha uh, from the CIA and uh, working with uh, Abdul Rashid Dostum and the Northern Alliance to uh, liberate Mazari Sharif, and and then in the response to the uh, prisoner uprising there at Kalai Jangi, where, uh, as all, I'm sure all of you know, the first U.S. casualty in Afghanistan, uh, Mike Spann, was killed during that uprising. And as a consequence uh, of the uprising, we ended up capturing Johnny Walker Lind, the American Taliban. And uh, it was really the the first major um, ground battle uh, of the of the war that got you know got that kind of attention. Uh, but I want to draw back uh, and kind of set the foundation for my remarks because I think it's important. It'll highlight the the degree to which uh, we relied on uh, the CIA for uh, what we jointly accomplished there. Uh, in Afghanistan. So as an Army Green Beret, our, our reason for existing is unconventional warfare, to work with resistance groups, um, particularly in denied areas, to overthrow or undermine hostile regimes. And that was the reason we were created after World War II, and it has been um, our core identity. Nevertheless, there have been a lot of discussions, uh, and in the years leading up to 9-11, there were a, a number, a significant number of people in our community that said, we're never going to do unconventional warfare again. We should abandon this and, and just realize that it's not, there's just, we don't have the political will to do this, and we should um, just focus on direct action, which ironically, um, happened after the last 20 years of uh, of operations in Afghanistan and Iraq and elsewhere. Um, but in those days, there were still a few of us that were true believers. And I just want to share a photo with you really quickly here and show you uh, this photo was taken on the um, in June of 2001 uh, at Ellis Island, the Medal of Honor uh, Ellis Island Medal of Honor ceremonies, which honor immigrants that come in. But as you can see, they're in the background, uh, the Twin Towers still standing. And right after this was over, I actually gave up command of the company and uh, became the battalion operations officer. And uh, about six weeks later, departed to go out to the Western United States to set up a multi-state unconventional warfare exercise for our battalion and uh, to to use horses and to work with indigenous forces. And it was exactly the kind of stuff that we ended up doing in Afghanistan. And again, ironically, 
I returned to Fort Campbell on the 10th of September from a, that 10 day trip, uh, setting up this exercise, which obviously we never got a chance um, to, to execute um, because we ended up here in Afghanistan uh, uh, not long after. Um, let me pause my share here and return. Um, so with the with the events of 9-11, uh, we ended up uh, obviously deploying, and that was really a, a significant challenge, particularly from a, a military perspective, because I had been uh, in the Army uh, for 15 years, and none of us had ever thought that we would end up in combat uh, in Afghanistan. I recall as a, as a young major or as young captain in the 90s, uh, going through the Khyber Pass, standing uh, at the Harbor Gate, looking in Afghanistan and thinking, wow, I'm glad that we're not over there uh, and not having, you know, being the position that the Russians had been in. Uh, we all knew the stories. And our, the 5th Special Forces Group oriented on the Middle East. I had lots of Arabic speakers uh, in my organization. I had Farsi speakers, a few Dari, but that was really it. We didn't have Russian speakers. We didn't have Pashto. And nobody on my team um, and spoke Dari um, or, or Urdu even. And so it was very difficult, again, because we had never anticipated that. The United States did not have any basing agreements uh, with any any of the countries in the area. Certainly, Pakistan was not going to allow us to launch offensive operations. And the, the behind-the-scenes diplomatic and military uh, maneuvers to get Uzbekistan to allow us to base there um, were tremendous and really moved at light speed. And again, I think we're uh, you know, facilitated... Uh, not only by our diplomatic and the military, but the intelligence community's relationships there. And so we established our base at Karshi uh in Uzbekistan, a former Soviet base, and um, began planning. I had landed at uh, K2 on the night of the 26th of October uh, 2001 and thought that I was going to be establishing uh, an operations center for my battalion. And I had literally just dropped my bags on, onto a cot uh, when uh, the sergeant major, my company sergeant major, uh, who was you know no longer mine, uh, approached me and said, "Hey, grab your bags. You're going into uh, isolation." And I said, "What?" And he said, "We're going in." And what had happened was uh, Secretary Rumsfeld was uncomfortable with the special forces ODA, the captain who had been assigned to work with uh, General Dostum and wanted more senior people on the ground. And so my battalion commander, who was a lieutenant colonel, was told to go in and we built an ad hoc team um, with a couple Air Force guys and what had been my company headquarters. Um, after several nights of failed attempts to get in due to the weather, the, uh, the MH-47, uh, helicopters from the 160th uh, Special Operations Aviation Regiment um, were challenged to get over the mountains, especially carrying the loads that we had had. And so we had gotten weathered out for a few nights. And in a, in a very humorous, um, now humorous um, episode, they came in, uh, our executive officer came and said, hey, we're going to parachute in. And I said, wait a minute, where are we going to land? Uh, because we were going into central Afghanistan and the, the drop zone they had picked out was a, a mountain a plateau that was about, oh, maybe 500 meters wide at its widest and at best a uh, 1,000 meters long, and which is a very small drop zone for uh, the static line parachutes. And I said, this is really dangerous. It, you know, and it, on each side, all these escarpments. He said, well, we're going to put you guys in, in rough terrain suits. You may have seen them, the smoke jumpers, the firemen that go in wearing the football helmets and the padding. You look kind of like the Michelin tire man. And I said, I've never jumped in one of those. When I looked around in my team, I said, has anybody here ever jumped in one of those? They said, no. I said, has anybody ever 
done a jump master inspection on somebody jumping in one of those? They said, no. And I looked at the yeah, XO, I said, we're not doing this. Uh, the the best we can hope for is that those those suits would keep all of our bones in the bags uh, to make for easy evacuation once we were dead. And so we waited a few more nights and we did actually uh, get in and we're met there at, after doing some false insertions to um, what we thought would throw off anybody tracking us. Uh, we linked up with uh, Team Alpha and Special Forces ODA 595 that had been on the ground for about 10 days. Uh, it was late, uh, you know, as we say, zero dark 30, no illumination. And it was uh, a little bit chaotic landing and getting settled in. Uh, but we did settle in for the night. Uh, General Dostum was asleep. And when we met him the next day, he told us that he, he had tracked our helicopters all the way from Afghanistan. He knew exactly where they were, um, which was a little bit uh, shocking and, and troubling. Uh, but it just goes to show you that you don't need a lot of high tech stuff um, to, to be successful in some of these environments. And uh, we, we linked up with General Dosum, uh, planned and synchronized not only with the, uh, with the Uzbek faction, but also with the Hazara and the Tajik factions of the Northern Alliance. Uh, on that same aircraft, we had put in ODAs with each of those elements and within a few days began our um our movement towards mazar sharif and we had originally um we took in a couple of john deere gators you may have seen them these six uh wheeled uh carts probably seen them if you've been at a golf course they use them for uh, lawn maintenance and because we couldn't get toyota trucks over the mountains because of the weight in the helicopters, we were forced to take the John Deere Gators. And uh, we were gonna use those for getting around, but it, they were very difficult to use. And Gerald Dostum and his team and his, his organization rode on horseback. So we rode on horseback. And as I was at pains to remind a lot of folks, um, there were no extra horses. Every horse that we rode was one that was surrendered by an Afghan uh, for us to ride. And that was applied the same to our, our Team Alpha counterparts and everybody there. And so it was a, a little bit challenging. Uh, what would made it even more challenging was the wooden uh, saddles. And for those of you who've served in Afghanistan, you may have seen one of these. Um, a the saddles made of wood with oriental rug remnants tacked on them and that uh, if you've ever rode on one of them you'll never forget it especially you spend 10 hours plus in one of those saddles and it was um it was quite challenging especially for some of us um i had been on horseback uh, only briefly as a as a teenager um was by no means an experienced horseman and i i wouldn't give that appellation to anybody else on our team, but we learned quickly and we we adapted. Um, and our rucksacks were then uh, strapped onto the donkeys and carried and met us later. So we, while on horseback, we wore our, our own personal uh, gear, carried our own rifles, um, but just ammunition, water, batteries, and a radio. Everything else uh, had to go behind us. And because none of our Afghan counterparts had their um, had any protective gear, we did not take helmets. We didn't take body armor. Um, we just we basically wore our our uniforms so that we would uh, be in the same situation as them. And over the course of uh, ten days, uh, with some real adventures, um, we managed to get to Mazar Sharif. Uh, along the way. I recognized how um, how realistic parts of our training were in special forces. The special forces qualification course uh, has a scenario at the in the capstone exercise where you lose rapport with your guerrilla chief and you're kicked out of the G base. And in our case, uh, General Dostum um, became very angry with my commander 
and told us he was going on a reconnaissance and he would be back in 24 hours uh, to pick us up and and left and left us on a mountaintop with one interpreter. And after 36 hours, we realized that he was not coming back to get us. And after a um, very pointed discussion with our interpreter, who was terrified of uh, of General Dostum um, and had been sworn to secrecy by him, he admitted that General Dostum had no intent to come back and pick us up. So uh, using that interpreter in our um, our training, we managed to rent uh, local donkeys and marched uh, down the mountain and caught up with them. They were now two days ahead of us. Uh, but we did manage to ke- catch up with them right before uh, we uh, the final push into Mazar Sharif. And I can only uh, describe General Dostum's uh, expression as surprised uh, when we managed to link up with him again. And not much more was said about it. Um, we just went about our business. Uh, there was going to be no no hurt feelings, but it was it was a scenario that uh, all of us in special forces had had experienced in the training scenarios, and it really was um, very helpful in uh, in dealing with our relationship with uh, the Northern Alliance and General Dostum. And again, thankfully, we had Team Alpha uh, with. Uh, one of the intelligence officers who had had a decades long relationship with General Dostum, which made um, our task uh, immeasurably um, simpler than it, than it would have been without that relationship. Uh, Mazar Sharif was, was liberated. And along the way, General Dostum did, uh, he, he flipped a lot of his potential opponents. He spent a lot of time on the radio um, talking to uh, the Taliban and telling them, "Hey, you know, you can you can switch sides, or you can be subject to bombings by the Americans." And uh, after after a, a few days, the word got out, and there was a lot of these Taliban that had that had basically stood aside um, and didn't necessarily join in, but did not oppose the advance of the Northern Alliance. And that became a, 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 real, con, a real factor um, later in November after the uprising or during the uprising at Kalai Jangi. Um, when we did arrive in Mazar Sharif, we set up uh, our uh, headquarters there alongside General Dostum at Kalai Jangi, which is a, a 17th century, 18th century fortress built by, uh, by the, I'm sorry, 19th century fortress, uh, built by the Brits uh, during their time in Afghanistan. Uh, straw and mud, but a very, very well built and um, interesting fortress with a moat around it. And on the parapets on the top, there was two slots for each, um, for rifles. One pointed at the near side of the moat, and if you put it in the top, it pointed at the far side of the moat. And they were uh, there was a ring of those around the entire fortress, which was quite quite large. Um, it had been General Dostum's headquarters um, prior to the Civil War uh, in ninety seven or ninety eight when they hit the Northern Alliance um, after the Civil War when they controlled the North. Uh, prior to the rise of the Taliban in the North, but he was betrayed by one of his commanders and lost control of it. And that had forced him to flee into the mountains uh, in central Afghanistan. And this fortress uh, was stocked. Uh, Every room that was not used for a living area had arms and ammunition um, to the ceiling. And in the Southern courtyard, there are what we call uh, connexes or mill vans, multimodal shipping containers, uh, stocked with arms and ammunition, uh, cases of Russian PPSH uh, submachine guns still packed in their original Cosmo link, ammunition, mortars, li- landmines, uh, rockets, uh, you name it, it was there in the fortress. Um, after about 10 days there, we decided to move closer to the airfield, which was on the 
eastern side of Mazar Sharif, and we set up uh, our headquarters in a um, <clears throat> in a former high school called the that we called the Turkish School. It had been built by uh, the Turkish government as a, a gift to the people of Mazar Sharif, and had been an active high school, um, but it had been abandoned now for several years, and. So we set up our, our headquarters there at General Dostum's urging, allow us to get to the airfield. Um, and we'd only been there a couple of days when the, the uprising began. And we had heard reports. Um, in fact, that, that morning I had spoken uh, with Mike Spann and, and Dave Tyson, who was you know, another member of Team Alpha. And they were going back over to Kalai Jangi to... Um, conduct interviews of these prisoners who had surrendered the day before. Um, and just to, to step back for a moment, in a larger context, uh, because it's important, uh, most of the uh, Northern Alliance forces had left the day prior for Kunduz, uh, which was at the time shaping up to be a climactic battle uh, between all the remnants of the Taliban and Al-Qaeda in northern Afghanistan and the Northern Alliance. And so the vast majority of those forces had had headed eastwards towards Kunduz the previous morning. Uh, just after they left, they encountered this uh, a caravan of semi-trailers loaded with Taliban and a, a very, very large number of foreign fighters. Um, Tajiks, Uzbeks, uh, Pakistanis, and including an American, Johnny Walker Lynn, as we would learn later, Australian um, guy, and all sorts of assorted uh, characters. And they, after some tense negotiations over their surrender, uh, which included a suicide bomber um, in close proximity to General Dostum, it was resolved that they would send them to the, the fortress at Kalai Jangi instead of the airfield where they had actually uh, initially asked to be taken, uh, which in itself was odd. Um, but they were not searched and they weren't properly uh, controlled. They were simply placed in the courtyard of the southern uh, portion of the compound and then were guarded uh, by what was left of the Northern Alliance forces, which was really a, a, a small um, rear detachment. And the next morning, while uh, Mike and Dave were there, there was an explosion. And briefly, um, uh, shortly thereafter, gunfire broke out. Uh, it's clear, it was clear in the aftermath that the prisoners had smuggled in some arms and uh, hand, at least one hand grenade and use that to kill some guards, seize weapons and began a general uprising. Uh, in the process of which Mike was killed, Dave was able to get away, um, but his whereabouts were unknown for uh, most of the rest of the day. And the prisoners seized control of all the arms and ammunition that were there in the Southern compound. Um, a confidant of General Dostum contacted me at the at our headquarters and urged us to come and assist. Um, I put together a small team with a couple other in intelligence officers that had remained behind from Team Alpha and uh, a British SBS detachment um, that had had come in recently, but uh, whose um, rules of engagement had not been set and they were actually told not to participate in any combat uh but being being sbs and having an opportunity they disregarded um and so we did respond that day we were able to get uh f-18s from a u.s aircraft carrier strike force in the gulf to respond and um there was about 600 prisoners and at this point uh, my little team, I think we had less than 10 people and got in a position to call in airstrikes and uh, did that, uh, brought in a, a number of 2,000-pound uh, JDAMs um, in what we would call danger close 
um, to the point where we were we were well within the uh, blast radius um, where you can expect over 50 percent killed or injured. And uh, but that was the only way that we we could even the uh, the odds and uh, and increase our chances of success. Um, even still, it wasn't successful. Uh, the battle raged for uh, another two days, um, including on the second day, a friendly fire strike where one of the JDAMs hit a uh, one of my positions uh, where there was nine, uh, nine individuals, uh, four U.S. and five uh, U.K. SBS, um, injuring but miraculously not killing any of them. And that uh, that was nine out of 13 people that I had that day. So uh, it was combat ineffective. We withdrew. We had a small, quick reaction force that helped us evacuate the wounded um, and spent the rest of the day getting them uh, medical care. The flight from Karshikhanabad to Missouri Sharif uh, at, at best was two and a half hours. And from the time we were able to notify them till they launched and and got there was over four hours um one of my uh one of my soldiers expired three times and was revived each time uh by one of uh, our battalion surgeon who happened to be with us there um it was a it was a, a, a medical miracle that none of none of them uh were actually killed in that incident and uh, because the room uh, beneath their position uh, was filled with arms, and, you know, with rockets and artillery and uh, mortars, and that JDAM hit at a at a point um, where there was a Russian T fifty five tank, and it sent that tank uh, up into the air, and uh, and it came. It came down on top of the turret, killing the crew and blowing um, my soldiers out into the the floor of the fortress. Um, so after successfully evacuating them, we went back that evening um, and went through. It was the first time that AC-130 gunships had been used in Afghanistan, and uh, we managed to go through two complete. Uh, loads of ammunition. The first aircraft had fired all its ammunition. The second it uh, came, fired all, all of its ammunition. One of the last strikes it did set off a, um, a conflagration of ammunition uh, that had been stored. It hit one of the depots on the southern side and it became untenable to stay there. Uh, so we, we withdrew and went back the next day and as the uh, Northern Alliance forces began to trickle in, the odds became uh, much better. And in the end, the Northern Alliance forces um, did the final assault and secured the Southern compound, except for the um, place that we called the Pink Schoolhouse. And in the basement, there was 86 of the survivors. Um, again, amongst them, Johnny Walker Lind. And uh, nobody knew they were down there initially. They had called in the American Red Cross or the International Red Cross to come uh, collect the remains of the deceased. And they, a Red Cross worker went down there and was shot and killed. And that was when we realized that there, was, uh, there were people in the basement. Attempts to talk them out did not work. And in a... Um, uh, what I can only uh, describe as inspired brilliance, one of the, the Northern Alliance uh, recommended flooding the basement with water. And that did the trick. Uh, late November um, in Northern Afghanistan, standing in waist deep water um, will make you want to abandon the position pretty quickly. And after uh, less than an hour of being flooded, they all came out and then were transferred to um, to Shepherdon Prison. We did manage to recover Mike's remains and uh, had a um, 
a repatriation ceremony and he was sent off on an MH-47 helicopter for his final trip home. Um, and in the coming days after that, uh, we began to repair the, uh, the airfield at Mazar Sharif. It was unsuitable. At the beginning of the war, the, um, the U.S. Air Force, following their kind of step-by-step -step playbook, had bombed the runway there and had left six large craters um, uh, on the runway, making it unusable, which uh, was why we had to use helicopters, because there was no fixed wing um, uh, landing strip that was usable. And with the onset of winter, starvation, um, and in the refugee camps, and we were told we needed to get the airfield open. And this I consider one of a one of the, our biggest triumphs there. We had no rebar, no concrete, no asphalt, no gravel, no heavy equipment, so to speak, no expertise, save for one U.S. Air Force uh, Red Horse uh, engineer. And yet we managed to repair that airfield. Um, working with uh, an associate of General Dosim's who ran the, a black market across the Amu Darya River, we purchased um, dozens of 55-gallon drums of tar. Uh, using the operations fund that we carried, we paid local Afghans by, uh, by the truckload to scoop up smooth river rock and deliver it to the airfield and began to fill these holes, these giant craters. And then um, we had them heat the 55-gallon drums of tar over a, uh, a open fire till it became liquefied and then poured it on the smooth river rock. And as it cooled, we used a Soviet era steamroller um, that one of our mechanics had gotten running and, and used that to level it out and repeated the process till we had a solid uh, runway. And uh, over the course of the next two months, we brought in over 200 aircraft. Uh, including Russian IL-76, uh, US C-17, C-130s, French C-160s, and a whole variety of other uh, fixed-wing aircraft to deliver these supplies and then distribute them out. Um, we had to um, repair the runway every few days um, and repeat the process. Uh, but again, we managed to keep that airfield open and did what I think a lot of people thought was impossible um, we thought it was impossible at first, but, you know, uh, we pride ourselves on our ingenuity as Green Berets. Um, the last thing I'll talk to you about is uh, uh, how we paid homage to those who were killed in the attacks of 9-11. Each of the Special Forces ODAs that went in on the initial wave carried with it a piece of the World Trade Center that uh, the group commander, uh, then Colonel John Mahal and now Lieutenant General retired, had had received from a friend in New York with instructions to um, bury those pieces of the World Trade Center uh, at a place in Afghanistan where we had inflicted a, a significant uh, defeat on the Taliban or Al-Qaeda. And we did that. And then each, uh, each ODA conducted its ceremonies, and then uh, we used our GPSs to record a nine-digit or 10-digit grid coordinate, excuse me, um, down to the meter of those locations, which was eventually plotted on a map and was given to the uh, New York Police Department, New York Fire Department, the New York Port Authority, and I personally delivered a copy to the 9-11 uh, Museum uh, when I served as the group commander in 2000, uh, from 2009 to 2011. And uh, that was a, a, a real um, moment of uh, very moving and meaningful moment for all of us uh, that we had managed to overthrow the Taliban and Al Qaeda in a matter of months. Um, really in a matter of weeks when everybody thought it might take months or years to accomplish that goal. Um, and back to my original comments, we could not have done that without 
um, the assistance and the relationships that had been established uh, by the intelligence community in the years leading up to uh, to 9-11. And uh, we in the special forces community had not taken that as seriously, Department of Defense um, had, didn't, even though we had it in our doctrine, we didn't have the, um, the fiscal and, uh, legal authorities to really do what we needed to do to establish those, uh, relationships. And thankfully, uh, the CIA did, and we were able to leverage those. Otherwise there, the, the likelihood of our early success there in Afghanistan would have been much, much lower. And I think that that set a, a tone um, that carried through in all my experiences in Iraq. And, um, and as I became more senior um, at the in Pentagon and the White House, um, I watched as our uh, the relationship both on the ground and in Washington, D.C. between the CIA and the Department of Defense continued uh, to improve and strengthen. And again, I was always at pains, you know, unconventional warfare relies on a, having a relationship with someone on the ground that you have developed over the years and that you can work with to achieve goals that are mutually uh, beneficial. And, but you can't develop those relationships overnight. And too many people in the Department of Defense uh, didn't realize that. I also want to point out too, again, back in the fiscal authorities, the, all the arms and ammunition that we supplied to the Northern Alliance, uniforms and uh, weapons, um, all came from the intelligence community. And one of the aspects of my uh, training that was not very realistic was in fact um, that aspect of it. In DOD, we had these uh, elaborate code books with what we called Marge Bundle Codes. And these codes were for specific packages of arms and ammunition that you could have, that you could request and that would be parachuted into you. And honestly, it wasn't until we got on the ground in, in Afghanistan that I realized the Department of Defense didn't have any of that. There, there was no DOD warehouses with um, arms and ammunition and supplies that we could provide to our um, our counterparts in the Northern Alliance. The CIA had that capability, we did not. And um, it was a huge, uh, to me, uh, one of the uh, most glaring weaknesses, again, that was mitigated by our relationship um, and the authorities that were present in the, uh, in the intelligence community. So, um, I, I just want to you know, say how grateful I am um, for the, the men and women in the intelligence community, uh, particularly those men that I served with on the ground there um, in northern Afghanistan uh, for being, you know, spectacular teammates who I still consider close friends to this day and I'm in contact with. And uh, for all of those who may see this, who I've had the pleasure to work with over the years, um, I, I truly value the service of the, uh, your service to our nation. So Jim, that's, uh, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Mark, that is truly a riveting uh, presentation. I know that all of our viewers um, will really, really um, enjoy watching this and uh, relive some very, very um, uh, brilliant memories. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's been an honor to join you today. And again, thanks uh, just for giving me the opportunity. Mm -hmm.